that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Energy Week with George Harvey, Tom Fennell, and Walter Gustafson. So I'm, is, I'm on this side now, so I'm right. raising the wrong we hand. We have switched <laughs> all around. I'm on the, I'm on the uh, right, and Tom is on the left. So we're more confused than normal. <laughs> Sorry to throw things off here. <laughs> <laughs> Introduce um, our guest. Walter is from Viberg. Correct. Which is also, uh, the Viberg is, a, is an acronym standing for the Vermont Public Interest uh, Research yes. Group. Public Interest Research Group. So this is not the state. This represents the people, right? Uh, it represents a little bit of both, certainly. Uh -huh. We are Explain almost... Explain to us. Yeah. Not, not to me. To <laughs> these guys. Almost entirely um, supported by <laughs> citizens of Vermont. Um, almost all of our funding comes from individual people. Every summer we go and knock on roughly 100,000 doors. Um, and that's what gives us the kind of moral high ground You're in Montpelier. You're the guys who come around banging on my door? We, we come around banging <laughs> on your door asking you to uh, partake in, in the political process and, and talk to your legislator and well, have conversations about these issues. Okay, and what I should do is I should probably explain that uh, to anybody who might not have seen this show before, what we do is we go through a week's news. And uh, I keep a blog called geoharvey.wordpress.com and um, every day, uh, get up early and, and put on the news of the day that I think is important. And um, each news item has a synopsis and a link to the article that it came from. And uh, Tom and I talk about the 20, 21, 22 of these items that we think are the most important for the week. Once a week on this show, which is recorded on Thursday, so we start the pre with the previous Thursday and run up to the Wednesday before, so without further ado, I think we can go to Thursday, December 3rd. And on that day, um, we had COP21 <coughs> underway in Paris. It's a conference uh, of people who are trying to uh, work out what the world should do about climate change. And we got this item from Vatican Radio. With COP21 underway in Paris, a conference in Rome on Thursday reflected Pope Fra on Pope Francis' social encyclical Laud Laudato Si on the care of our common home, hosted by the Action Institute for Study of Religion and Liberty, the me meeting examined what role free markets can play in helping to protect the environment. What have we got to say <laughs> for that? Uh, I'll just interject a couple of things. I was wondering why they called it COP21. Oh, yeah. And it is the 21st conference of the parties. Yeah, why don't you switch the picture? Everybody should see our smiling faces. There you go. There we go. I By wanted to golly. leave the picture up for a little while. Oh, okay. So it was the Champs Elysees. Yes. But any, anyhow, the 21st conference of the parties is, a, as, as, as you have probably guessed by now, a world climate summit. Yeah, and they've been pretty busy for the last... It was, it's been pretty busy. They're supposed to wrap things up tomorrow, which is, which is the 11th of December, and they might actually do that. Well, there's a takeaway from what the Pope said there, because you referred to the Pope. You're allowed to quote the Pope. Free, well, actually, this is, this is not <laughs> quoting the Pope directly. This is Robert, Father Robert Sirico, okay. who works for the Pope. Oh, okay. <laughs> Free markets are coordinating mechanisms. It is the free exchange that people have, and through the price system, information is exchanged. The price gives you a clue to the relative scarcity of the thing being sold. Without this knowledge, the result is a throwaway culture. However, as Pope Francis points out in Laudato Si, there is a danger of reducing the human person to a creature that is defined by consumption. Oh, that's boy. a mouthful there, you yeah, know. That's a mouthful. Yeah. What he's identifying, now here comes the religious aspect of it, what he is identifying as consumerism is a form of idolatry. It is worshiping the created thing more it's than the creator. Mammon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It, interesting quote, anyhow. Yes, indeed. 
we are up to so let's move along Gizmodo, to the India. Uh, in the wake of another bout of devastating smog, China announced today that it, it, today being um, a week ago uh, that it plans to cut its power em sector emissions 60 percent by 2020. That's not very far away. A promise that puts China, U.S. clean power plan to shame. Of course, Gizmodo India didn't come from the United States. If fulfilled, the pledge would make a major dent in global carbon pollution. China's cabinet made the announcement at COP21. And there you see not fog. That's that, smog. That yep. is smog. That's definitely smog. Made up mostly of we, smoke. We have shown a number of pictures yeah. on this show fact, of smog in China. We've got two this we've week. We've got a couple of them, yeah. yeah. This, this picture, I think, is, is, is always draws a really stark contrast for me. You know, when you look at the, the responsibility of, of different areas and the situations that different people are in as a result of, of pollution and climate change, and you know, we, we don't have to face anything like that, yet here we are with yeah. ample opportunity to, to do something about the issue. So it's really interesting to see how, um, how drastic some of the situations are in, in other places in the world as a result right. of, of pollution. Right. Well, according to The Guardian, and I think I agree with it, coal is the real culprit between, behind China's choking pollution. Yes. Which, in addition to warming the planet, poses a major public health risk. And we've talked about this. We have indeed. Contributing to a slew of respiratory problems. And it's unfortunate because in much of the third world, all they have to opt for is coal. Yes, for now. For now. Yeah. So while we're cutting, and the Chinese are cutting our reliance on coal, India is increasing it. Yes. And some of these numerous other small countries are increasing it. Who's going to win this race? Well, it, it, we're back to the question of how, how are you going to, for in India, for example, how are you going to bring electricity to 300 million people without Renewables. <laughs> and, and clearly, the easiest answer and the cheapest answer, because you don't have to build transmission lines. Solar. Is solar. Yeah. And they're, they're doing it. Clearly. And they but they're not doing it. They're doing it on a very large scale. But India is a very large country. Yeah. And honestly, <laughs> I think the Indians have been, and to, possibly the Chinese, have been building out their coal plants in order to be able to um, extort the developed world into giving concessions at COP21. Well, I think we talk about that later in the show. Yeah, I think we do. I think we do. Okay, our next item is from Clean Technica. 21st Century Fox, the parent company <laughs> of Fox News Channel, is the first on a list of 73 major companies that have just signed on to President Obama's American Business Act on Climate Pledge. A total of 154 major U.S. and global companies have signed in support of a strong outcome for this week's COP21 Paris Climate Talks. That's an interesting development. Now, we don't have a picture for that one, do we? No, I don't think we do. Okay. Our, our next picture is uh, a wind farm. It's, it's up behind uh, Walter. We'll get now. to that, but I just wanted to comment on yeah. this, and that's what this article is all about. Fox News has been opposing any efforts to, to mitigate climate change. Yes. But this is Fox News's parent company, parent company. <laughs> which is being very green. It's just And I wonder if I wonder <laughs> if Fox News even bothered reporting this one. Uh, maybe they didn't know. You know, there are things that they're ignorant of. <laughs> just, just, just a few. It is really interesting to see the contrast between um, the media that has been pushing some of the um, climate denying narrative and then the funders of that media um, and their differences in addressing this problem because when you you know look at climate change from an economic um, standpoint it makes a lot of sense to start to move away from fossil fuels and start oh, to make yeah, those investments absolutely. so it's, it's really funny to see some of these huge companies uh, recognizing that within their within their own portfolios yes and and pushing to have to get action done and of course that's something that we saw starting among other places in the in the um, insurance industry, but it's also true uh, uh, in the medical industry, and it's true among banks, and, and I mean, basically what's happening, um, General Mills signed on to this, and mm -hmm. why? Because they need to, ha they need to, if they're going to sell food, they need to know that it's going to get raised. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you want to be at a, at a competitive advantage in the 21st century here, you, you don't want to be reliant on fossil fuels. It's not going to, no, not, not the direction not you want your company work. to go in. Okay.
Before we get, go off this, this is a good article. There's a lot of meat in it. Yeah. And there's too much meat for us to talk about here. We'll be talking that's, about it. That's true. Look it up. Look it up. Geoharvey.wordpress.com. Go to uh, Thursday, December 3rd. And uh, is that right? Yes, that's the one. But now <laughs> we're on to Friday, December 4th. Uh -huh. In the first 10 months of 2015, the U.S. installed... 4.18 gigawatts of wind and 1.4 gigawatts of solar power generation capacity. Renewables accounted for 63% of all new power capacity in October, 200 megawatts of wind, 33 megawatts of solar, and 10 megawatts of biomass power generation capacity was put online. This is from CNews Renewables. And, you know, it's remarkable because there's a certain amount of, there about a third of the, of the, of the electric power that's been put online in the last year has been natural gas. Yeah. Natural gas has only grown 1%. And the reason for that is because as they're putting new plants on, they're taking, taking old, old plants, plants off. off. <laughs> and so... <laughs> and it's a bubble. And it's a bubble. I, th I'm, I feel Tom and I have been talking about the natural gas bubble for quite a while. Oh, it's something I'm very familiar with. I, <laughs> something that actually brought me back to Vermont was the, the natural gas quote unquote natural gas um, pipeline that is going down through through central Vermont. So the one that goes um, to Middlebury? Yeah. That's a very to. complicated issue. It you is. Know, the, 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 and, and a lot of people don't realize this, but a lot of the gas that goes through that pipe is going to be fracked. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. But some of the gas that goes through that pipe is going to be from biodigesters. And Middlebury College has been has the wrong because they want their biodigesters that are 20 miles away to pass them mm -hmm. natural gas through the pipeline mm -hmm. instead of bringing it down by truck, which <laughs> is, you know, this is, it, when I think of Natural moving. gas by truck is not the, <laughs> not the brightest yeah, idea we in the definitely world. Have to, we have to move away from, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, the, the infrastructure that we're investing in around natural gas altogether, certainly. Right. That picture, by the way, is uh, a, a wind farm in New Jersey. And uh, that Beautiful. accompanied the, uh, the article. So our next item is from PC, PV Tech. Google has purchased the output of renewable energy generation facilities around the world, totaling 841 megawatts. The company has to date invested in more than two gigawatts of renewable energy facilities and claimed the 481 uh, megawatt megawatts of deals is, quote, the biggest ever non-utility purchase, end quote, of renewable energy. So we have a, we actually have a graphic that goes with that. This is the, um, can you, can you put that I'm going to put it up, yep. yeah. We're, we're just experimenting with this new <laughs> way of pick, putting up pictures. And um, this is, uh, this map basically shows you where Google has been putting its, um, its renewable facilities and what those facilities are in uh, around the world. And you'll notice that there are four different uh, operations in those, in those rings at the bottom, one orange, three blue, which are all in the United States. And then there's... There's a bunch of them up in, the, up in Europe there. Yeah, though. there's there's a bunch in, in Can't Europe. Can't see them one, too well, but they're blue. Italy. So this is, this is a, you know, they had an infographic about their two gigawatts of renewable power. That's a fair amount of power. And just, what is, what? just create business innovation as well. Yeah, it is. And as a matter of fact, one of the things that, that we have been seeing people talk about in the news is the idea that Google is turning into a utility of its, of its own. Yeah. It's providing itself with power. And then well, they're using selling. all this stuff themselves. Yeah, but they're selling their excess to the grids in uh -huh. various places. And that makes them, that makes them uh, take on a, a much bigger presence than they had ever had in the past. And almost an energy provider in, in some well, way. Yeah. yeah, they are. And um, that, that uh, item was, oh, I said it was from PV Tech. Our next, our one, next. One quick one oh, here. Okay. They just opened a uh, data center in Alabama. Yes. And data centers use a lot of power. A lot of power. This is going to be 100% renewable from day one. Yes. Okay, yeah. so yes. they're putting their money where their mouth is. Oh, yes, they are. They are. And for good reason, when you consider that after they've got the pay down done, they've got po their power for free. How about that? Uh, we have an item here from the Sydney Morning Herald which is the one that this, this guy looking at the solar panel is associated with. The sustained rise of power bills over the last several years has prompted a surge in Australian households wanting to do it yourself 
by unplugging from the grid, which may result in further declines in carbon emissions. It also might result in further declines in revenue. utility <laughs> revenues. As much as 90% of the households are looking to renewable energy. This is from the Sydney, Sydney Morning Herald. And that must be frightening to the to the utilities in Australia. I don't think they predicted that was going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, if they didn't, they weren't thinking very fast. I don't think they predicted it. Yeah, oh, this boy. this is as uh, who who was it? I'm trying to think of a television camera, a television show, where where the guy always said, "What a revolting development this is." <laughs> <laughs> it was its tagline every. I, I don't, don't even remember, remember what show it was. I don't remember. What a revolting development I this is. That, but that, that I think it was back. called The Life of Riley. That's what it was. Huh? Oh, the, um, uh, what was his name? Walter Bendix. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. He, that was an interesting show. <laughs> okay. Moving our, right along uh, here. Moving right along here. This is, a, this is an item that I was walking around telling people about all day when it happened. This comes from care2.com. In an announcement made in the United States Conference on the um, Climate Change in Paris, in the UN's con conference, and we got a picture for that one, don't we? Paris, we do, and there it is. Ah. You can you can put it up. Okay, Monsanto will stand trial for ecocide and crimes against humanity and nature in the International Court of Justice. An umbrella group of over 500, or, I'm sorry, 800 organizations in 100 companies is involved in the action. That picture is a picture of a march that took place <clears throat> in Oregon um, last summer, I think. Uh, but it was, uh, you know, people are upset at Monsanto. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, oh, yeah. That's great news. <laughs> this, this, a quick takeaway from here. The trial is, quote, a global citizen's tribunal. Yes. Okay, that will include dozens of international food, agriculture, and environmental justice groups. Yes. And, uh, and, and included, there's a couple, this one's interesting, millions against Monsanto. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and as it should be, right? Organic I mean, Consumers well, Association, Regeneration International, and IFOM. I don't know what IFOM is. Organics International. I could, this is something I could see General Mills getting behind. I mean, Monsanto's, Monsanto's schemes here for taking over... The, the agriculture in the United States, the business of the, of the genetically modified organisms and the, and the, um, the, uh, uh, the insecticides, pesticides that, that you know, they, they are, they d depend on. Well, yeah, they're bullying everybody. They're bullying everybody. It doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> At least it doesn't work as 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 advertised, because the the things that they're that they're uh, destroying are the things that they're targeting for that destruction are are getting to be immune to it. You so, could probably comment on this in within Vermont. Now we got the GMO labeling law, and Monsanto has got the big guns out. Yeah, I mean, I, I can tell you personally that Monsanto has inspired me to. Um, continue the work that I'm doing many times <laughs> in, in many different ways. They have a really long history of, um, you know, dodging regulations that are really basic for consumer protection and consumer health. Um, the amount of chemicals that they have been able to move into products in our society that are, are really damaging or, or are our banned in other areas is, is tremendous. Um, and yeah, with the GMO labeling bill, they, they certainly were um, leading some of the opposition. And now with the Dark Act in, in the national setting um, on Congress, which is the quote unquote Deny Americans the Right to Know Act, it's certainly not what industry is calling it. Dark, um, Denying <laughs> America's Right to Know. Yeah, yeah. So this is a bill that would supersede any um, state legislation requiring companies to label genetically modified products. Um, so, so yeah, this I think is, they, they this is pretty going, significant, isn't it? Yeah, and it's been going on for a long time. And they're the creators of Agent Orange way back when. Um, they they have a, a pretty bad track record and, and, and need to be held accountable. Roundup. Roundup, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and things that affect, like you were saying, the, some of the basis of our um, ecological system. Are they, are they manufacturers of the nicotinamides? I can't imagine they're uninvolved because they are so, in every chemical issue, I worked against Monsanto um, in California when I was working to ban plastic bags out there because they are so involved in um, chemicals and petroleum chemicals right. that are involved in creating plastic bags. So they're part of the American um, 
Chemistry Council, which is one right. of the most powerful lobbying groups in the country. For anybody who wants to know, the nicotinamides are the, are the um, chemicals that, that are used for uh, herbicides, and they have fairly long life and they carry in the wind. And they are very destructive to certain plants, one of them being milkweed. Yeah. And because mm -hmm. they're so destructive to milkweed, if, if you have wonder for a moment why you haven't seen any monarch butterflies, it's because they're an endangered species now. Yep. Because and the milkweed's because disappearing. Because the milkweed's disappearing, and that's the only source of food for their, for their larvae. And, you know, it's a, in my generation, in a lot of places, the first the first understanding children had of uh, the life cycles of insects was from studying monarch butterflies in kindergarten, yeah. you know? And the monarch butterflies, there are children now who are in second, third grade who have never seen them. And they were one of the most common. And they're so beautiful. Very beautiful, very uh, interesting because they have memories. That Do you, they? Um, we had one of the most bizarre things I ever saw was in a chemical plant that I worked in where where we were recovering iodine, scrap iodine, and this stuff was just awful. You went near, the, it was boiling in a stainless steel <laughs> pot. And if you went near it, you felt like somebody was throwing sand in your eyes. And um, I, was, I was working near this thing one day and I saw, it was outside, and I saw two monarch butterflies come over the, the, build, the top of the building. And they circled around and circled around and went closer and closer to that vat of of boiling iodine, scrap iodine, and then they went into the purple smoke that was coming out of the top and going down the sides. And they just went into it and I thought, oh, they're gone. And after about 30 seconds, they flew back out again. <laughs> and the next day, they came back. <laughs> I don't know what was in that iodine that they wanted, hmm. but it didn't hurt them. Um, and they, I've known people who have said that they, they would put Diluted honey because t honey straight is too is too thick for them, but right. diluted a little drop of diluted honey on their finger and they just hold it like this, and the and the the monarch butterflies would learn that at a certain time of day they could come and get some of that, hmm. and they would come, you know, and he said this is this is um, these are not entirely unintelligent insects like a, a number of others, mm -hmm. um, but they're they're uh, Interesting guys. Anyway, we're we're kind pollinators. of pollinators. They're they're important pollinators. They're, they're important culturally important. You know, you, you, these are things that we shouldn't be ignoring. Okay, <clears throat> our next item: a senior Indi Indian nego negotiator says his country will cut back on the use of fossil fuels if it gets sufficient cash from a Paris deal. <laughs> the country believes rich nations responsible for the bulk greenhouse gas emissions released so far must provide cash if they want developing countries to cut their emissions. This, this is kind of a little TV, blackmail, isn't it? TV newsroom. It's kind of like <laughs> saying, I'm going to kill everybody in my country from, from you know, asthma and, and emphysema unless you guys give me some money. <laughs> and it's, it, it, it is really something that I think is revolting. It is, but it's an, it's an interesting concept, I think, because when you, you think about the advancement of some of these first world countries and you look at more developing countries and, you know, they're going to want the same quality of life that we want. Oh, they absolutely. are going to want there these no um, technologies. They shouldn't and, want a better quality of or, life. Or, or better, and they're going to want to get there fastest um, or faster. And so I, I think, you know, the, the leading nations do have a responsibility in some sense to address that discrepancy I don't, a little I don't bit. disagree with you on yeah. that. But I do think that this kind of, I, I, this, this is an approach I find, as much as it's understandable, it's disturbing. So. Yeah, it's both. It is. Both. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Sunday, December 6th. Moving right along. And this is from the Irish Independent. I think well, these are You've related got a picture to you, on this Tom. One, don't you? The, as renewable energy. You got a picture from this one. We have a picture from yeah. this one. Ah, no, we no. don't. Yeah, we do. That came from the Irish. That's, that's the picture. Oh, that's the picture. Yeah. By golly, you're right. Okay. 
You know, that's where my mind is. Don't pull it's it up. Just kind of absent today. They're not Irish in that picture. They're not <laughs> Irish in that picture. That's right. As renewable in, uh, technologies have become more cost effective, investors are now waking up to opportunities in the previously unattractive green sector. Climate change is a reality, and we appear to be in the middle of an energy revolution. Environmental investments are both right and smart. If you can look real close at that picture, and I don't quite understand it, the guy that's doing the kissing is wearing a mask. He sure is. <laughs> and she's kissing him through that mask. You know, this is um, romance will pro will uh, prosper wherever it can, even in a in a in a smog. Anyway, um, should we go on, Tom? Let's see if there's anything here. I'll, I'll just quick sentence here. This is from. The Irish Independent is about the uh, conference, mm -hmm. and it says, in short, climate change is a reality, and we appear to be in the middle of an energy revolution, the catalyst perhaps being the Paris Climate Conference, which yeah. ends this Friday. I think that's I think tomorrow, a lot isn't it? Catalysts, you know, the, the the fact that we've got into an environment where it's cheaper to put in renewable energy than it is to put in any other form of energy. If we're not there, we're going to be there next week. <laughs> yeah. I think we're there already. Absolutely. Okay. BBC News told us, and I'm gonna, I have a picture here. Got here a picture we, for this one? Yeah, more smog. Delegates at the um, UN Climate Conference in Paris have approved a draft text they hope will form the basis for an agreement to clur curb global, global car <laughs> global carbon emissions. The 48-page document will be discussed by ministers on Monday, which is last Monday, and they did. They will try to arrive at a comprehensive settlement by the end of next week, which is as we talk this week, and it looks like they might just do that. They're on the path. They're, They're on, on the, the path. path. What this document is, and I'll have a quick sentence here, it lays out a range of options for ministers the from each country yeah. on what the long-term goal of the deal should be as well as the scale and the methods of raising climate finance for poorer nations. Right. So, you know, they're looking at the right things. Yes. And the poorer nations do need help on this. This is not something for sure. that, you know, we can just cut them loose and say, you guys fend for yourselves. It won't work. It won't work for them, and it also won't work for us. If India is, is um, and China are stuck, so, so is uh, Indonesia, so is... So are a lot of other countries, and you know these are countries that have their own resources. Okay, the ecologist, and this is the same day. I'm just looking back to see what day, December sixth. The ecologist told told us the Paris Climate Conference today, December sixth, published a, a draft treaty that sets out a warning limit of 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial pre-industrial levels as its long-term temperature goal. Seen as a victory for poor countries, it reduces the limit of two degrees warming that had previously been agreed to as a safe uh, level of warming. That is interesting news. That's really interesting. I think that uh, you know, you're seeing more and more that as we start to pay some real attention to the scientific community, that we are in a, a, a little bit more of a drastic situation than we may even realize at the time. And so it's, it's, it's interesting to see rolling back of some of those standards. I, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking to myself, they thought two degrees was a, a limit beyond which we could not go. And when, when we've gone to one degree and they're seeing the damage that's already being done but being denied by the Heritage Foundation, we, you know, <laughs> we can see, you know, and the damage, the damage is real. It's, so, so the two degrees is really too high. The two degrees is too high. Yeah, I mean, I think it was it was too high um, several years ago. You, you you know that 350 was created as a benchmark for the 350 parts per million that we should allow in our atmosphere in terms of carbon. We're already content. to 400. Exactly, we're well over um, 400 now. And you look at. Um, you know, several years ago, what the financial cost was to the state when Tropical Storm Irene came. It was, you know, $733 million. So we are there. Yeah, we are there. And we can, we can um, if in case, you know, Tom and I have talked about this many times, houses and, tr and forests and things like that falling over because the permafrost is melting. Oh, quite and, a disaster. And, 
uh, whole countries at, at risk of being washed out by, by rising seas. To not, say nothing of Miami Beach. I was going to say, <laughs> Miami is not the only place. I mean, New York's going to be hurt. Philadelphia's going to be hurt. Problematical, hurting. and yeah. there's a point at which you are not going to be able to keep the water out of the subways. Yeah. Yeah. And after that, there's a point at which you're not going to be able to keep the water off the roadways. Yeah. And, you know, long before that, all of that infrastructure in New York City has got to be either protected or abandoned. And protecting it means probably building a seawall around a 20-some-odd mile Long Island. That's mm -hmm. expensive. It's something like that could be required. Yes. If they're going to save New York, they're going to have to do something. They are. This article, by the way, from The Ecologist, is very long and very comprehensive. There's a lot of good stuff in it. If you guys are interested in doing some research on this, Google Victory Cop 21. Oh. It will come up. Yeah. It'll be the first one that comes up. It's, if you want to do some research, this is going to take you all day, but this is a very good article. <laughs> and if you can't find it... You can, you can call Tom and say, what was that? Victory again? COP21 <laughs> will get it for you. Okay, and COP21 is COP221 with no spaces. Our next item comes from Nikkei Asian Review. The U.S., Japan, European, and other developed nations are poised to consider boosting their annual financial assistance for developing nations. Well, by golly. To over $100 billion in 2020 and beyond as a bid to break a COP21 deadlock. It's not a COP21 deadlock, it's an environmental and climatological deadlock. <laughs> the money would include both public and private sector funds. Well, this, this article repeats what we just heard a couple of minutes ago. As a condition for any agreement on a post-Kyoto international framework, which is what they're trying to come up with now. Right. Kyoto happened, what, 10, 12 years ago? Anyhow. Developing nations are demanding increased financial assistance from developed nations to cut their greenhouse gas emissions and help them take messages against floods and storms. Yeah. And this is just what we talked about. And Vermont is, um, yeah, so the Kyoto Protocol, actually in 1990 um, was, was when that was created. And was it 1990? Yeah, yeah, so it was a while ago. Um, and Vermont has actually based some of its goals uh, around that. So we have some greenhouse gas emissions uh, goals to get to 75 percent below 1990 levels because, like you said, that was um, what we were considering then, and we are far past it right now. So far past, uh, far past those 1990 levels. So we are currently we were above them. We'd like to be 75 percent below. below them. Currently, Vermont is level with our our, our 1990 in levels in terms of in terms of carbon dioxide emissions. In terms of greenhouse gas emissions, okay. so you could you could we have all reduced, greenhouse gases. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. we've not reduced our greenhouse gas and, emissions since 1990. We have very little greenhouse gas emissions associated with our electric supply. Yeah, absolutely. But people have to realize we're driving cars, and the cars put out you know a burning a gallon of gasoline is something like 22 pounds of carbon dioxide. And I know that it's kind of mind-boggling to think, gallon of gasoline is only not even seven pounds. How's it getting twenty? Very pounds? concentrated energy. Yeah, but it's got a lot of carbon in it, and mm -hmm. that carbon, every carbon atom in the ga in the gasoline when it burns, pulls two oxygen atoms out of the air, and those two oxygen atoms each weigh about about a third more than the carbon atom weighs. Mm -hmm. So you wind up having a thing in which less than a third of the of the weight of the carbon dioxide molecule is the carbon from the from the gasoline the rest comes from the atmosphere that's, that's interesting that's i never thought of that why the that's you know it's it's why a, a gallon of gasoline is 22 pounds i think it's 22 pounds i think it's something around that carbon dioxide and that means that you know if you're getting if you're getting... Uh, oh, <laughs> that's an aha moment. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And, and on top of everything else, that doesn't even count the carbon emissions that come from producing the gasoline. Yeah. And on yeah. top of everything else, <laughs> that doesn't count the carbon emissions from shale oil, if that's where it's coming from, which are going to be two and a half times as great as what actually comes out of the gasoline itself. So if you've got a car that is, is getting 65 miles per gallon, which is a really, really good yeah. rate by our, uh, uh, for our cars today, you're putting out a pound of carbon dioxide every mile you drive. Yeah. 
And that's an whoa. interesting way of looking at it. It is. And, you know, I mean, they, they measure this stuff in tons. Yeah. Tons yeah. of carbon dioxide. Wow. Another, yeah, it's, it's, there's, a, there's a lot that we're, we're putting out there. Another really good way to conceptualize that is, um, you know, think about, if you're thinking about how much energy it takes to drive your car, think about how many hours of work you would have to put in to push your car <laughs> the amount of miles you would like to drive. Yes, and so yes, that's yes, people yes. hours, you know, that's, yes, that's yes. real time. And so it gives you a good perspective of, yeah. of what and it really it. takes. But you know, there's another one that I like, and that is during the Second World War, the Germans had a had very small supply of oil, much less oil mm -hmm. than they would have wanted to have. So they were prioritizing the oil in terms of sending it, you know, to the to the military. Well, the result of that was that people couldn't get gasoline for their cars. People couldn't get, you know, in some places they couldn't get gasoline for their buses. Mm -hmm. So um, the people in Belgium came up with a solution for this, which was slight modification of the engine. You could run the bus on ammonia. Right. Okay. Ammonia gas, yeah. which, by the way, is not what you put in your you washing machine. You do not want to get near this stuff. <laughs> no. But if I if I saw uh, uh, you know if if we had ammonia in cars on the roads, uh -huh. an accident could be a very serious problem because it would just release that ammonia very fast, and people would die as a result of that. But nevertheless, ammonia works in a in a gasoline uh, mm -hmm. engine internal combustion engine. And if we had that for buses and so forth, and it was it was properly protected in in the cylinders, we could run on a, on material that produces no carbon dioxide emissions. Mm -hmm. yep. Wow, what a concept! Not to mention the fact ammonia that is like nitrogen and hydrogen. Nitrogen and hydrogen, yeah. and when you burn it, you wind up with nitrogen in the atmosphere, and you which wind up there with already water is water <laughs> in the atmosphere, which and there already is. Yeah. And um, so, you know, and, and of course, much more realistically, we could change all these vehicles to the fleet. And we could actually change vehicles in many cases. That happened. Uh, I remember uh, seeing some pictures of cars during the war in Germany yes. with trailers behind them. Yes. With little gas generators in the trailers <laughs> that they're running the cars out of. And the gas right. generators were running on wood. Yeah, so, yeah. so they were running so the cars were, on wood. They were running their cars on cordwood. <laughs> yep. <laughs> And that was all over Europe, by the way. They did. They did not just it. Germany. Not just yeah. Germany. They did it in Spain, which wasn't even part of the part of the war. Okay. Um, our next item. We got a picture for this one. We have a picture. Uh, the this is the this is the one that is the from Nikkei Asian Review. Yes. No. International Business Business Times Australia. Uh, Australia. We're up to December 7th. Yep, okay. one day. International Business Times AU. Australia agreed to support the push to lower global warming to goal to 1.5 degrees in a Paris deal in exchange for more favorable carbon emissions rules. With this, New Zealand youth delegate um, dared Prime Minister John Key to follow Canberra's example and also for Wellington, which is the capital of New Zealand, to back a more ambitious global climate target. And you know, there's stuff going on there that it just boggles the mind. You know, I, I will I will obey a much stricter law if you'll let me break it. <laughs> <laughs> really. Interesting takeaway from this article. Indonesia could lose about 2,000 islands by 2030 due to climate change, yep. according to the country's in environmental minister. Yes, and many of these islands have got people living They've got there. people, yeah. They've got yeah. villages. They, might, they have towns. They, they, we're talking about a situation here where all around the world, those places that are, that are relatively poor and next to the sea are in serious trouble, and that includes towns in the United States. Oh, yeah. Very serious trouble. They have to move the town because the sea is rising. Absolutely. This also reminds me of um, the climate talks from last year. There was um, an indigenous woman who wrote a poem. I don't know if you remember when this came out. It was pretty well received and, and well, um, you know, it went viral, as they say. Um, 
and she, yeah, she wrote this poem and read it to the UN delegates uh -huh. and got a standing ovation. Um, and so I just wanted to remind folks of that. I'm sure you'll have some viewers who remember it. I want to say that it was somewhere in the Philippines. Okay. Um, that's just off the top of my head as I remember. But I remember it was one of the most moving pieces of climate, poetry, um, from the heart, in front of a really tough situation, mm -hmm. you know, very, a very public crowd. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, it was, so it's interesting to see that that was the focus point there. And, and it's still here. Um, mm -hmm. We have these islands that are going underwater as a result of climate change. I, well, I think we'll be talking a little later in the show about this exact same thing happening in Alaska. Yes. And you know, what it reminds me of also is um, a friend of mine was telling me about driving along uh, a beach in Florida with a friend who said, you see these mansions here? This is not just poor people. You see these mansions here? Look at them. They don't, none of them has a car in front of it. Mm -hmm. None of them has a car in the driveway. Mm -hmm. They can't show them. Because they're all abandoned. Yeah. Abandoned mansions yeah. because they're too close to the beach mm -hmm. and you can't get insurance Bingo. on them. So you can't sell them. There's no, no <laughs> bank is going gonna, is gonna to hold a mortgage. And so a lot of wealthy people are losing their money because of something which some wealthy people claim isn't happening. Yep. You know, there it is. So the Koch brothers can say that it isn't happening. But right. And, and where much of our country's wealth is invested in currently, too. Yes. But, you know, the, if, you, if you look at the, the, oil, the oil, Dow Jones oil and gas index, down 40%. The Dow Jones coal index, when it got down to uh, below 16 this, this week, it was at a high of about 750. Yep. It went from 750 to 16, and it's lost all but two of its, all but two of its, um, of its uh, components because they were delisted or went out of business or something. Yeah, don't don't have to be a stockbroker to see what's happening there. No, you know, <laughs> it's uh, the the coal the ho the whole U.S. coal uh, business is in serious trouble, and there, there's no way that they can change that. It, I mean, they can. They can get Congress to pass supportive laws and so forth, but it's it's not going to go away. And denying that it's happening is only going to make things worse for the people who deny. Okay, so um, that picture that we have is of a picture of a, of a fisher and fisherman in, in Indonesia, uh, watching, Indonesia. Yeah, watching the watching the uh, ocean, and of course the ocean is rising. Okay. Our next item is from Renew Economy. The co a company responsible for more than one-third of Germany's electric grid says there is no issue in absorbing high levels of variable renewable energy such as wind and solar, and grids could absorb up to 70% penetration without any need for energy storage. The CEO of the 50 of, I'm sorry, CEO of 50 Hertz, not the 50 Hertz, 50 Hertz is a company. That's the name of a company, yeah. Says, industry views on renewable energy integration have evolved. And boy, have they ever. When they're saying re, re, uh, absorbing high levels of renewable energy going to 70%, that doesn't count what they're getting from biogas. It doesn't count what they're getting from biomass. It doesn't count what they're getting from hydro. It doesn't count uh -huh. for anything they might get from geothermal. It doesn't count a lot of things. <laughs> and by the time you're done, what he's saying basically is we don't need batteries, but they're nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was going to say that. We don't need the batteries, but they're nice. Yeah, yeah right. Good way of putting it. Yeah. Okay. Thomas um, Reuters Foundation told us that Ch uh, China's capital issued its first ever red alert for pollution. The Beijing city, city government said on Monday, warning that the city would be shrouded in heavy smoke from Tuesday until Thursday. That's today. China's leadership has vowed to crack down on environmental degra degradation, including air pollution, now covering major cities. And you know, we had a we had a report a couple of months back saying that 4,400 people are killed by outdoor air pollution in China every day. Every day. Every wow. day. And honestly, you know, the World Health Organization says seven million people per year worldwide, which means ten, almost 10,000 people a day, 
And I don't believe it. I think it's higher than that. I think it's higher than that. Yeah, but that's not outdoor air pollution. That's outdoor and indoor. And, and there's a lot of We've, indoor air pollution. There's a lot there. of problems with people who are in the... They cook know, in one room. Yeah. Everybody lives Four in one room and... Unvented uh, fires for cooking, and that's a serious problem. But nevertheless, if you take that seven million at... Um, at a, at me, and, and a little bit more than half is outdoor, that means 10,000 people per day worldwide are being killed. And if you do a little calculating and you say, oh, okay, in, in Paris on the 13th of November, 137 people died in a terrorist attack over a period of uh, 218 minutes. 137 people died in a period that worldwide killed 1,368 people from outdoor air pollution. I was just thinking about exactly that. We get all hit up over a terrorist attack where stuff like this is going on all the all time. All the time. And <laughs> when the terrorist attack was over, the attack on people's lungs just kept going. And it goes day and night worldwide, and most of that is from fossil fuels. And thank you very much. Mr. Exxon Mobil. <laughs> yeah, right. Thank you we've very talked much about that to, one. to the Koch brothers, who, of course, as we all know, are philanthropists. Yeah, no, this is, this is, this is <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a bad philanthropy business as well. And, and, and this is a reality that just is not talked about enough here in the United States at all. You're throwing out those numbers in the United States. We have 60,000 deaths per year from air pollution. Um, and, that's, and that's a significant number when you're no. upset about people dying. Yes. When I was young, I'm talking about college age, um, I had a friend who was a scientist who was one of the best toxicologists in the country. And he said he believed that over a thousand people were dying every day. Then? Fr then, from the, from the res results of our dependence on fossil fuels. And most of that was cancer of kinds that you would never necessarily imagine would be associated with, with um, breathing in toxins, because it's not lung cancer, and it's not cancer of the larynx or the tongue or something like that. It was cancer of the liver, and it was cancer of the pancreas, and it was cancer of the kidneys, and it was cancer of you name it, leukemia, you name it. And he said that, you know, the oil, if people knew what the oil industry was doing, they wouldn't, they wouldn't put up with it. And quite honestly, I, I don't think there are very many people in our society who get into their F-350 and turn on the ignition and say, ah, I'm going to go kill somebody. But, I mean, really, they, they're contributing to children's asthma and old people dying of emphysema. Yeah, and, it's, and it's, it, it touches on dishonesty a little bit, too, I think. You it's know. Hypo yeah, there's a hypo hypocrisy involved right. in this. And it's sad because people don't think about it, and the reason why they don't think about it is because uh, part of it is the media just ignoring the whole thing. They have a very good public relations program going. Yeah. And, and, okay. and it's yeah. been going for a long, long time. Yep. It has been. There we have it. See it? Behind us? <laughs> go to the, go to the, the, oh. the other camera, Tom. Okay. Uh, Tuesday, December 8th, after a long, low-level negotiations in Paris, climate talks delivered a drafted agreement that left all the crunch numbers unsolved. Foreign minister and environmental ministers stepped in, warning that the clock is still ticking toward climate catastrophe, and that's, those words are his. UN Secretary uh, General Ban Ki-moon told the ministers the world expects more than half measures. This is from the Weather Channel, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> from the Weather Channel. And this, this Two degrees is not enough. <laughs> that's what it, that, that's the yeah. headline on it. And here we have, you know, behind us here, um, you can you can click on that one. Uh, there is no there is no planet B. Um, this is this is uh, we don't have a choice. You know we 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 can't even go to the moon, and that's close. <laughs> <laughs> there is no planet B. Yeah, this is a demonstrator, young woman in in Berlin on November 29th, the first day of the of the climate talks, and uh, I suppose we could go on from there. Our next item, by golly, who do you suppose that is? Bernie Sanders, senator uh, from Vermont, released his ambitious plan for climate change. Who? Bernie <laughs> Sanders. Hey, everybody, listen up. 
Bernie Sanders. <laughs> That's the only name you need to remember. <laughs> The problem, he pointedly says, is being perpetuated by the billionaire fuel, uh, fossil fuel lobby. The plan reads like an ecological wish list. It would, you, it, it would um, reduce U.S. carbon pollution by 40% by 2030 by such measures as putting a tax on carbon. What an interesting idea. And cutting subsidies for fossil fuels. This is from the Washington Post. British Columbia has a tax on carbon. And who is, who is looking at that and saying, yeah, we can do that too? Alberta. <laughs> Alberta? <laughs> yeah, yes. They wow. actually did it. The they Texas actually, of Canada. They have adopted a carbon tax in Alberta, which is a, an oil-producing uh, province. And, of course, who else is looking at this? <laughs> Vermont. Absolutely. Yep. That's right. And so you can call your legislat legislator and you can say, we need a carbon tax, or if you don't want a, if you don't want a carbon tax, ladies and gentlemen, you can say we need a carbon fund, which you can fund with a tax. Well, you know, I, I'm I'm looking at this and thinking, well, the damage that's being done by carbon emissions, are it's just unbelievable. The 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 what's happening to the climate? Hey, if you live in Vermont. And you've got Lyme disease in Vermont, you're probably a victim indirectly of the fossil fuel industry. Because Lyme disease didn't used to be here. Yeah. And if you are looking out at a forest of hemlocks in, in Wyndham County, where Brattleboro is, and you're seeing a beautiful forest, and all of a sudden, a year or two from now, it looks stressed. And the following year, that whole forest is turned red. And the following year, all of those trees are dead. And that's so happening. You, you've got a ghost forest there. You only have to go to Massachusetts to see it. Well, you can blame the fossil fuel industry through, through carbon emissions, because the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has, has moved uh, the, the warmer air north. And you know, we're moving into agricultural uh, zone six here. We might be in the next in the next yeah. planting guide in zone six. I don't know, but well, if we if we continue on the trajectory that we are, um, we will have the climate of Tennessee by the end of the century. Um, so if you yeah, I heard Virginia, but that's basically the I same climate. Yeah. So it's a, yeah. it's Virginia by um, by 2070, by the end of the century, Tennessee. So you know the the, the longer you know, we I, wait, I have the further been south in we Tennessee go. Tennessee once, and, <laughs> and the one time I was in Tennessee, it was really hard to get out of that state because there was eight inches of snow on the ground. No kidding. Wasn't a <laughs> snow plow in sight? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but it's it's interesting to see Senator Sanders. Um, you know, step up to the plate here. And there was some that say his plan is, um, you know, a little ambitious, but... It's not, it's not overly ambitious. It, it right? really isn't, and this is no. a common... I've got a takeaway on his plan here, what, right. what he's talking about. It would ban Arctic oil drilling, ban offshore oil drilling, ban fracking for natural gas, yes. stop exports of liquefied natural gas and crude oil, and put a moratorium on nuclear plant license renewals in the United States. And I could go with all of those. Yeah. He's also proposing hefty investments in several clean energy sources, including solar. Mm -hmm. Seeks to increase fuel economy standards for automobiles, build electric vehicle charging stations, invest in a state-of-the-art rail system, and make U.S. cities more walkable. Who could disagree with any of that? Well, you know, and, and I think <laughs> Other than the Koch brothers. In, in 1962, <laughs> when I was 15, I was in Germany, and in Heidelberg, I was at the youth hostel, which is a ways out of town, and you'd walk from the youth hostel to the trolley line and take yeah. the trolley into town. And riding on the trolley, going into town from outside of town, women would get on in the morning carrying what looked like small pizza boxes. And I turned to a fellow next to me and I said, what are they carrying? And he said, they're carrying their eggs to market. Oh. The farms had trolleys going by them, and the, f and the women who lived on the farms and earned a little bit of money from selling eggs would take those eggs on, the, on public transportation. Why can't we do that? Yeah, these, these are not pie-in-the-sky ideas. No, and it's <laughs> extremely convenient. Yep. And you tried moving around Vermont without a car, not convenient. We have not enough time left for what we're going to do, so let's try to plow through these. Moving um, right the along. The Detroit News says uh, Michigan's two biggest 
power companies are up against both liberal Democrats and conservative Republicans over what they pay customers for, uh, for or what they pay customers for electricity from solar panels. Environmental Democrats and Tea Party Republicans have joined forces to promote choices for customers and alternative energy. And this is the Green Tea Coalition. That's right. And this is the when Debbie Dooley, who founded the Atlantic um, Tea Party, went to uh, Florida and tried to push solar panels, solar uh, down there, the Heritage Foundation jumped on on her mm -hmm. without naming her or saying where she mm -hmm. came from. They said the Tea Party in, in Florida had been infiltrated, mm -hmm. which they use as a word for <laughs> socialists getting it. Okay. <laughs> Every year, Lazard uh, Associates publi uh, publishes its levelized cost of elect energy analysis from different types of power plants, including wind, solar, natural gas, coal, coal, nuclear, and other technologies. Their analysis shows that wind energy and solar power are more affordable than ever, and in fact, they beat fossil fuels even without federal incentives. And that's fossil fuels without incentives for renewables, if you took away the, the subsidies that are given to the fossil, fossil fuels, fuels, they'd beat them even better. Mm -hmm. And the cheapest power we've got is wind right now. Right now. Right yep. now. Okay, Wednesday, December 9th. We're finally coming down on it. Rising global temperatures are helping to speed up slow-moving landslides across Alaska Known as frozen debris lobes, they are threatening a major highway. The warming climate is said to have hastened some of them to a heady speed of five meters per year. This is a landslide going at about 17 feet a year. Engineers about a half inch a, a day. <laughs> slow. Engineers believe they either have to freeze the ground under it or move the highway. That's now, interesting. I'm going to go on here. We've we see we got this another picture, picture here, don't we? Or do we, we have another picture that is with this story, and this is the landslide itself. Oh, come on! There we go. There, we there go. is the landslide. You can see the leading edge of the landslide getting down close to that highway. Well, and that gray stuff is the landslide. Yeah, that gray stuff is is basically mostly snow or ice. And here is the next story. I'm just going to read this. Alaska is suffering significant climate impacts from rising seas, forcing the relocation of remote villages. Governor Bill Walker says that coping with these changes is hugely expensive. He's talking about the changes that are brought about by climate change, which Heritage Foundation says doesn't exist. He wants urgently to drill the protected lands in the Arctic National Wilderness Refuge to fund this? That sounds a little bit silly, doesn't it? Ninety percent of its <laughs> revenues come from oil and gas. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, this is like I, 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 I don't know how to get out of the problem I've got with alcohol, so I think I'm going to have. I think a I have a couple of drinks. <laughs> a couple of drinks. <laughs> really? <laughs> this is bizarre. Oh man. And um, I'm going to read. We could get back to that, perhaps. But if I'm going to read. Some time. Yep. I'm going to read the next item. Few. Figures from researchers at the University of East Anglia and the Global Carbon Project suggest that global, global carbon emissions will stall in 2015. The re researchers predict that not only might the growth of CO2 emissions slow or stall this year, but there might even be a chance emissions will decline by 0.6% in 2015. This is from So we're doing something Clean right. Technica. Somebody is doing something Somebody. right, but I want to point out to everybody, this doesn't mean that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is going to go down. Right. It means that it's just not going up as fast as it was. Mm -hmm. But it's going up pretty Still close going up. as fast. Difference between 100% and 99.4%, you are not going to notice with your eyes. You're not going right. to notice with your nose. This is a, it's a serious problem and we've got to do better. <laughs> and now what we've got is um, people, the federal government going to certain businesses and saying, we've got to deal with fossil fuels and that means you. And they say, oh, there isn't any climate change. <laughs> but we're patriotic. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, we are at the end of the broadcast, but Walter will be here for an hour on a special that will deal with VPIRG.
and that is exciting. Absolutely. And I believe that will probably appear a couple of times, several times. I don't know how often this week. I think about five or six. Five yeah. or six times on Channel 8. As an extra. As an extra. It'll and be the week Energy Week extra. extra. So we'll say goodbye. Bye. Adios. And uh, well, you got the correct hand this time. <laughs> <laughs> See you next time. To all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it